year. The New Zealand Spearfishing Nationals 2022. This year's competition was truly memorable, with spiteful conditions and challenging diving. With a looming forecast of vicious weather, the Nationals proceeded. Divers from all over the country are here to compete and it will take more than a little rain to stop us. The Hen and Chicks Islands were the first destination, nearly becoming the final resting place for one boat. Second day was the Whangarei Heads. Join me in this episode as we go deeper, look harder, to find what went wrong, what went right, and what we can do to improve. After last year, I was more than keen to compete in nationals again. Unfortunately, my dive buddy, the man, the myth, the legend, Salty Flap Spearfishing on Instagram, Charlie Cust, had moved back to England. Trying to find somebody to dive with was interesting to say the least. I had a few people say yes. They ended up flaking on me. Until a few nights before the competition, I had nobody to dive with, put a post up on my Instagram, and your boy Marcus comes through. A keen young fella living in Matamata, been spearfishing for about a year. I say if you're in, that's us. The start of a day's diving can be very overwhelming. Do you swim away from other people? Do you swim where everyone else is going? Do you swim this way? Do you swim that way? In northern New Zealand waters, where reef comes to sand, you will often find pori, roughly resembling the snapper. While snapper are often elusive and highly cunning, the pori, you can usually swim straight up to them and shoot them. As me and Charlie found out last year, efficiency in competition diving is everything. When you shoot your fish, kill it, put it in the float, reload your gun, you want to get that done as quickly as possible. You never know when the next opportunity has come by and you want to be ready. You really can waste quite a lot of time fiddling around with tangled float lines, getting your gun reloaded when you're unfamiliar with it, all that stuff that you really should have down pat. When your weapon is ready and you're relaxed, it's down to the bottom for your next target. While some fish on the list may be small in nature, the goatfish and kohiru for instance, you are required to get reasonably large ones, above 450 grams gilled and gutted, which for a goatfish or kohiru is surprisingly big. Often when searching for these species, the challenge becomes not finding them, but finding one big enough to shoot and for it to weigh in the competition. I don't have great eyes for fish weights, I don't usually weigh my fish, but this blue mau mau looked big enough to take. The conditions this day in the water were fairly good. Getting over on the boat was not very nice to be honest. One boat had a really hard time and we'll discuss that later. But conditions in the water were pretty nice. Not the best viz, but given how much rain there was beforehand. Like seriously, it was raining for like a week constantly before this weekend. And the viz was fine, so I was pretty happy with that. We have a fair amount of time. We're in the water for six hours. But that time goes very quickly when you're spearfishing. The time you're actually spending on the bottom compared to the time you're out there is drastically less. So you need to make every moment count and really optimise your time. Spearfishing can be very exciting. It's easy to get ahead of yourself, especially in a competition. But you always want to take the time to make sure your equipment is set up correctly. Negligence on your part can lead to not only embarrassment, missed opportunity, going hungry, but also injuring fish. Rest assured, this poor eye will escape unscathed. My shooting line is around my roller rubber anchor, causing the shot to skew. Excitement can also cause you to rush opportunities. Fear of missing out on them, when in reality you're making the situation worse. Taking long shots at fish that are angling away from you is not a great way to spearfish. Luckily for me, I'm diving with Mark, and he manages to pick up a butterfish. These kelp lovers are often found up in the swelly shallows, where waves meet rocks. I find that when the swell dies down, the butterfish go deeper. Spatial awareness is very important in the ocean. You need to know what is going on around you at all times. While I'm just trying to give him a fist pump, I could have just as easily been a shark, or a current sweeping him towards the rocks. The best way to learn is experience, and everybody gets caught out one day. There's heaps of them in here. Just need one though. Cruising along this reef, I spot a poro, planning on making it the second one for the day. Lining up, swimming towards it, extending my gun, I spot a second one out behind it, 
This is the fish they decide to line up and shoot off. This opening day, we had decided to stay in the first bay, working it up and down, while a lot of the other competitors decided to head further out, further abroad, in search of the fish. I learned from last year, you don't want to spend the whole time swimming. Last year, we spent so much time swimming around as opposed to actually diving. I can think of two main approaches when it comes to finding fish, covering area and covering bottom time. The first approach is you try to cover as much area as possible, swimming around, locating the fish, diving on them. The second option is maximizing bottom time, staying in particular areas, getting good breathe ups, working areas and trying to maximize the time that you're spending on the bottom. All right. All right. The yellow down in his ankle. Ah, coherent. All right. So if you see any big ones of those, shoot them. The tasty as as well. When I say maximizing bottom time, I do not mean minimizing surface intervals. At an absolute minimum, you want to be spending twice the time at the surface as you are at depth. If you don't have a dive watch to keep track of your surface intervals. I highly, highly recommend getting one. Your perception of time in the water is very different. So I mentioned that one boat had a hard time, and well, here it is. It sank. We're not sure exactly what happened, but something happened on the way over to cause water to flood in and sink. The owner of the boat came back from competing, swam around the corner, wondering where his boat was, asked someone, and he's like, mate, your boat sank ages ago. Absolutely gutting. I would be in disbelief. While still tragic, it realistically could have been much worse. It could have been, for instance, some fishermen out by themselves, but luckily for us, it was divers. All of us wearing wetsuits, protective floating gear, plus there were at least 15 other boats in the area able to help. As divers, it's in our best interest to protect the environment, and most people understand this. The first people on the scene bent their dives, removing anything that could potentially pollute the ocean from the boat. Fuel was removed from the boat as well as any loose plastic items and rubbish. I couldn't help but smile, almost even laugh when I was inside the boat. It was such a weird and novel feeling, being not only vertical but underwater inside of a boat. And yes, the bung was in the boat, that wasn't the issue. I know some of you were thinking that. Obviously be mindful when diving in overhead environments. You don't want to entangle yourself, especially free diving. You have to get to the surface or you die. Luckily this is a pretty safe control environment with many experienced divers around. Even the oldest, saltiest, crustiest sea dogs. Decades of commercial fishing experience on the high seas must certainly see the humour and crack a smile when seeing this boat. Major props to the owner, it seemed like a super nice guy and he took it really well. A lot of people in that situation probably would have lost their cool, maybe turned the spear gun against themselves. Mindset is everything. This could have been viewed as a catastrophe. However, it ended up being a major inconvenience, but a funny one at that. Seeing this boat was truly fascinating and it was a nice break from scouring every weed line trying to find that 450 goat. However, it was time to get back to shooting fish. That's why we're here. In this dive, you can see that I'm approached by two different species that I'm actually meant to be targeting, Cohero and Trevally. However, none of these individual fish were big enough to meet the 450G mark, so I let them be. My favorite place to park up is on the bottom, where the reef meets the sand. This area, known as the weed line, is home to a huge variety of fish. Most of the species on the list can be found here. Grunting underwater is a very effective way to draw the attention of fish. Sound travels extremely well underwater. This sound is particularly effective with predatory fish, sharks and kingfish for instance. However, it can also pique the curiosity of smaller bait fish. This cohero became a victim of the grunting technique, initially drawing my attention because of its larger size and visible wound. At first, I'd thought that I'd shot this fish well, rattling it pretty bad. However, when I got to the surface, it came back and really started going at it. The fish tore off my shooting line and tried desperately to evade me. I hit it somewhere in the spine or the brain so it really wasn't very coordinated. I was able to swim when it wanted to but had no control of the direction. Injuring fish is one of the worst feelings in spearfishing. 
I'm going to do everything that I can to try and get this fish back. It's important not to lose perspective. You still want to take time on the surface, breathing up, making sure that you're diving safely. I was tempted to try and shoot the fish, but Koheru don't present much of a target. When they're swimming around like this, it's really hard to line up on a shot. As well as that, I knew if I missed, I was potentially missing out on the opportunity of something better. It was possible that while this Kohero was swimming around, flashing about, we could have had a kingfish come through. This is a good example of how inadapted we are to the water. Even with fins on, I'm having a really hard time trying to keep up with this wounded, borderline disabled fish. And trying to grab it is a whole nother story. Almost hopeless. Some fish like to take shelter when they're injured. For instance, snapper. Sometimes when they're wounded, they will go down into the rocks or kelp to hide out. Kohero aren't so interested in doing that apparently. Being a pelagic fish, it makes sense. As this whole fiasco began to drag on, it became more and more funny. However, I really started to doubt whether I was using my time effectively. After having spent the last 5 to 10 minutes trying to finesse this Kohero up into the surface and up into my arms, it finally begins to tire. A few fish had taken interest in the Kohero throughout the ordeal. No target species however. No huge 20 pound snappers, no massive kingfish coming through to snaffle it up. I managed to get quite close to the Kohero on this dive. It gives me a slight break and I capitalise completely. Getting very close to the fish, giving a bit of a hug and bringing it up to the surface with me. Finally succeeded in getting this Kohero. The funny part about it is despite all the time and effort I put into getting this fish, it didn't even weigh over 450 grams. Tasted good at least. To prevent any excess or totally extreme catches, most species are limited to either one or two individuals. We thought that this year the species limit on poro was two. We were wrong about this however. Given that we already had two poro in the float, I decided to leave these ones, just watching, seeing if potentially any other species were hanging out with them. Fish hanging out in an area can be pretty random, but sometimes there's a good reason for it. It's worth doing a drop, sticking down there for a little while, and seeing what happens. This instant had a couple trevally come through. Too small to shoot however. I love summer, but one thing I look forward to, potentially more than anything else, is diving with sharks again. I love seeing sharks when I'm out spearfishing. Most of the time you see them, you're going to have a fish on your spear, and it can sometimes get a bit hairy, but occasionally enough you'll be lucky enough to encounter them while they're out doing their own thing. They're usually very shy and timid, and don't like hanging around too much. This one came to say hi, but got a bit spooked. Example of the calm, docile nature of the poor eye fish. If this was a snapper, it would have spidey sensed its way out of there many moments ago. Before I dive, I generally have a pretty good idea about where I'm going. Finning on the surface, looking for a place to dive, and paying attention to light and dark areas. Areas that I presume to be reef or sand. Often I'm looking for the intersection of these where I dive down onto the weed line and wait for fish to approach me. Seeing fish from the surface is a great indication that you're in the right area, whether they be down on the bottom or in midwater. Not all weed lines are the same. Some can be very defined, while others are more like broken reef structure. This messy assortment of rocks and kelp can sometimes be more productive than a more defined edge on the weed line. John Dory in particular really liked to hang out in these areas. Trevally can be found in many places, commonly here on these broken weed lines. I believe Trevally to be a lot more cunning than people give them credit for a lot of the time. In the distance I spot a few Trevally acting shy, geezing a fish hard, immediately extending and swimming towards it really works out in your favour. From that dive I was able to establish that the fish that I'm after are there, but I need to do something different. I'm going to move back a bit, I'm going to drop down into the kelp, somewhere where there's a bit more cover, but still in that same area where I know the fish are hanging out. You always want to try and anticipate which direction the fish are going to come from. I position my body so my main facing direction is out towards this sandy shelly area where I believe they're going to approach from. Scanning around with my head still regardless, because you never know what's going to approach, and from where. I spot my target the Trevally out to the right. I press myself down into the kelp, hoping to minimise my profile, hoping to entice the Trevally to come in closer. And they do, but I rush my opportunity, extending out towards them too early and scaring them off. Swimming towards them, in a last ditch attempt, 
desperate, but failing. Embarrassing myself. And potentially ruining my chance with these fish forever. Back down to the bottom, we're going to have another crack at these trevally. We know where they're hanging out, we know what we got to do, we just got to make it happen. Getting down to the bottom, hiding in the kelp, pressing myself down, facing out towards this open shelly area where the trevally often like to hang out. When you find trevally on reef structure, often they don't like to be right over the kelp. Presumably, it's dangerous for them. Predators could be hiding there. They like to hang slightly off the bottom and generally over the sandier area. Between dives, you can never be sure if the fish are still going to be there. Going down to the bottom, I'm crossing my fingers and hoping to see the fish again. Out over the sand, right on cue, right where they were meant to be, the trevally appear. This one was a good size, definitely going to weigh for the competition. This fish led to an immense level of satisfaction. The multiple dives trying to hunt these fish made it all worth it when I managed to finally put a shaft through one. Very, very satisfying. Trevally often seem to be quite cunning and never really get the respect they deserve as fish. Trevally are a fish that truly fascinates me. I love hunting them and I love eating them. I'll often take shooting a trevally over pretty much anything else. The smaller models aren't usually too cunning, however there's some big boys I've seen that haunt me to this day. Marcus was also able to pick himself up a trevally at the same spot. Due to the competition rules, me and my buddy Marcus had to dive quite close together. However, there are many benefits to this, mainly safety. But it's also really cool being able to communicate with your buddy on the surface when you come up from a dive. Be like, hey I saw this down there, you should take a drop, check it out. Things like that really help you land more fish. Often you'll be better off side by side than out trying to cover different areas. It's going to be safer and you're often going to dive more effectively because you can communicate. Heading down to the weed line at this spot, it felt fairly promising. We had a bit of tide running, a bit of bait fish. I could see them from the surface so I decided to take a drop. On my way down to the bottom I did some grunts, hoping to attract in some predators. What came in was not exactly what I was hoping for, however a pleasant surprise. This shark and along with it some really big koheru. I lined up, tried to take a shot on one, but ended up whiffing it. I'm pretty sure this would have made the 450G mark, but it wasn't meant to be. To me, there is nothing cooler than sharks. Sleek, agile, dangerous and sexy. These creatures are awesome, and I love seeing them. Whenever I see a shark, I can't help but follow it for a bit. Okay, that just about wraps up competition day one. However, getting back from the hen and chicks was very interesting. With Herb's boat, we managed to pull up the sunken one and get it out onto the plane. The boat that I was on with Dwayne Herbert and his son, we were taking turns jumping onto the flooded boat, bailing out water while going through chop and rough seas back to the mainland. It was pretty full on. I missed a couple of the best bits, but I'll let the footage speak for itself while I talk about our results for competition day one. So we actually thought we did pretty well. We shot a few fish. I had made a big mistake, I just assumed that the species list was the same as last year, including things like Blue Mau Mau and Pore. It was when we got back to the boat, had a talk to Dwayne Herbert, that we found out that neither of these species were actually on the list. At the weigh station was a bit embarrassing, our Kohiru didn't make the minimum weight. We actually only had two fish that counted for the competition, Marcus's Butterfish and My Trevally. Definitely some room for improvement tomorrow. However, it was a difficult day out there, and most teams really didn't get more than a few fish. At the end of day one, our team was placed as 16th. It hurt a little bit, to be honest. I knew the next day we had to do better. Luckily for Marcus and I, we are on the boat with someone who knew what they were doing. Dwayne Herbert. Since I started spearfishing, this is somebody that I've looked up to, with possibly more national title wins than anybody else. As well as that, national records, been on TV shows for spearfishing, dude is a legend. It was really interesting to see how this guy operates, absolute weapon, as well as getting some advice from him. Jumping in the water the second day, I was feeling a bit more confident. Today we're diving the Whangarei Heads, an area that I'm somewhat familiar with. Now that me and Marcus have dived the day together, we can be a lot more comfortable in our procedures. Alright, let's get it. Day 2 underway. Starting off this day I decided to take a pole spear with me. 
This may seem like a strange choice, but due to the poor visibility, I felt like this was potentially going to be a more effective weapon. Using a pole spear allows for significantly reduced reload times, which is one of the main hindrances when spear fishing in a competition. When you're taking a lot of shots at fish, you end up spending a lot of time reloading your gun. Using a pole spear can absolutely minimize the amount of time you waste. The start of the day is often always a race. You're trying to get in front of the other teams trying to beat them to the fish. When I felt Marcus pulling on the line, I initially thought, come on bro, we need to keep moving. You might have shot a butterfish, but chuck in the float and let's keep going. But when I swam over, I was absolutely delighted to see Marcus there with a donkey snapper. At less than five minutes into the day, this gave us a great sense of confidence and optimism for the rest of the day. Oh, you champ, that's a good snapper. <laughs> Give me a fist bump. Yeah. I just came around the corner and I saw him just tuck into the weeds and I was just snuck up above him and just shot him through the head. That's fucking mean, bro. That's Stunned. a good snap. First snapper. First snapper. Yep, you heard it right. First snapper. Very first snapper and it's one of these big dogs. Unfortunately for him, it's probably going to be downhill for a while. A term thrown around by a few people was ruined. If you shoot a snapper this big your first time, it's probably going to be a while till you shoot another one. However, stoked for it. Absolutely over the moon and it couldn't have been at a better time. After a short celebration, we're back on the move. Trying to cover ground, find fish, and beat other people to the spots. Having had other people dive on an area, it can actually make a significant amount of difference to the fish that are there. Often, a lot of the good fish will leave. They will be spooked by the previous divers and you're gonna be left with all the bait fish and non-target species. In a competition, it's very important to beat people to the spots that you wanna to get to. <laughs> Butterfish are a great target species on pole spear. They're generally quite friendly and not particularly large. However, I wasn't quite able to close the distance on this one. Definitely too keen and approaching the fish too fast. It can be hard enough staying relaxed and hunting effectively sometimes, let alone when you're in a competition. You tend to get very excited. There are some butterfish. After the initial excitement of the snapper early in the day, things started to slow down quite a bit and we had some trouble getting on to our next fish. Dropping down onto this weed line, I make it down to the bottom and have a look at what's around. If I make it down there, I'm not seeing anything. Some of the first things I'm gonna do is start grunting and start dusting, hoping to attract in some fish. Looking ahead of me, I managed to spot this John Dory that was sitting there the whole time. John Dory have excellent camouflage and they often rely on it very heavily, just sitting there until you shoot them. However, sometimes they do make a run for it. This one looked like it was on its way out of there, but I managed to get a shaft into him before he could escape. John Dory are a great target species in spearfishing competitions. Often, when they see divers, they're just going to sit there. There's low chance of spooking them off the area. If other divers aren't as observant as you, there's a good chance they're going to swim past, not see them, and leave the John Dory there for you to pick up. It's just a matter of being keen, tuned in, and know what you're looking for, and you'll be able to pick up a John Dory or two. These fish seem to be fairly common, and we catch them all year round. It's just a matter of finding them, really. Once you've found one, you pretty much got one most of the time, but that's the hard part, just finding them, spotting them, when they have such good camouflage, and just sit there in the weeds. After having spent a bit of time in the water, Marcus and I's diving style became quite systematic. Getting this fish to the surface, I dispatched it and Marcus then put it in the float while I reloaded the gun. Things started to become very efficient towards the end of it, as we were able to work in a team more effectively. As far as guns go, Rob Allen's are brilliant. Ultimate reliability and sufficient power for almost every fish you're going to shoot with them. However, I gotta say, I don't like the handle, and I don't really like the way the guns feel. Unless you're using one with a carbon barrel, I find them very heavy through the water, especially the non-carbon barrel roller guns. Not pleasant to dive with. They are good guns, but I don't think they're quite deserving of the godlike reputation they have garnered in recent years. Here in New Zealand, they are on the higher end price-wise, and when you spend hundreds of dollars on a gun, you don't want a plastic handle, a plastic muzzle, and just a cheap feel overall. They feel reliable, but they feel cheap. There is an argument to be made for using a plastic mechanism. 
not rusting, less wear on the parts. Rob Allen's done the test, but I'm just not a huge fan of it, to be honest. I think if you're going to charge hundreds of dollars for a piece of equipment, be using top of the line stuff, not plastic. If I was in the market for another spear gun, I'd probably buy a rifle or something like that. Something a lot more hearty, with build quality that you can really feel. Not to say that Rob Allen's can't do the trick, because they certainly can. Don't get me wrong, I love Rob Allen gear, and I use it myself. From knives, float lines, rubbers, load assists, I use a lot of Rob Allen gear. But I just don't think it's deserving of the godlike reputation. I have witnessed Rob Allen roller anchors pulling, load assists pulling, and spear guns with misdrilled holes so they were offset. It's not perfect stuff, but it's better than most of what you'll find on the market nowadays. Rob Allen's good, but it's not god tier. I'm going to use the Rob Allen knife to dispatch this goatfish. And this is a piece of gear that I can really get behind. I think it's a great attachment system. The elastic straps around the leg is great. It's a really good knife, super sharp, great for cutting things. However, it can get a bit slippery. There's no binding on it. It's made from one piece of metal. It's sexy, but it's kind of hard to hold. As mentioned previously, all fish that weigh need to be over 450 grams gilled and gutted. This is the biggest goat fish I saw down there, however getting it to the surface, I'm not 100% sure it's going to make the weight. However, we're going to take it anyway. If it doesn't get weighed, it's going to get eaten by us. Using twin bands is a great setup for competition diving, and was utilised by most pairs during the competition. Having two bands allows for a bit of redundancy. If one of the bands breaks, it means it's not the end of your day, you've got another one. And if you need to reload quickly, you can load one band and get down there ASAP. The water wasn't particularly clear today, making spotting your buddy from the surface quite difficult. When they make a dive, you need to watch the float line to get an idea of where they are, as well as doing a bit of guesswork to figure out where they're going to pop up so you can keep an eye on them. Safety should always be your top priority. And when you're diving in a competition like this, it's not unusual to push yourself a bit. So it's important that you're watching your buddy and your buddy's watching you. Always remember this, live to dive another day and no fish is ever worth your life. Finding the goatfish was no trouble the second day. However, it's always just about finding one that's big enough. Using the pole spear down on the bottom, I'm trying to line up on which one looks the biggest. This one looks pretty good to me, so I take a shot. Not getting full penetration on the spear, so I lunge it through, securing the goatfish. Definitely not a monster this one. I'm thinking it might just go the weight. Never know, soon find out, see how it goes. Regardless, this fish is gonna get eaten. No fish taken during the competition were wasted. All of them were eaten either by the competitors themselves or people who placed bids at the fish auction. Initially, it was this puffer fish that drew my attention. After following it for a little bit, I managed to spot a butterfish out in the distance. Lining up, I managed to get a reasonably long shot on it, hitting the fish quite well however. Very stoked. The difference between placings often isn't a lot. Every fish makes a difference, so to land even one is cause for celebration. A common reason for not competing in spearfishing competitions is not wanting to kill a bunch of fish needlessly. However, often, I find, you end up killing a lot less fish than you think. When there's so many people diving in the area, it really does make it quite difficult. If you consider the amount of people that entered in this competition, if everyone went out on a weekend by themselves doing their own things, a lot more fish would be caught as a result. I don't necessarily believe that spearfishing competitions lead to an excessive amount of fish being caught. The species list can be quite limited. This year in particular, I was very happy to see the Mau Mau and Pore off the list. Even though we ended up shooting them, I thought last year it was a bit of a shame to have those when it just led to needless slaughter when every team was going to shoot them. Having a couple of the easier species off the list led to a lot less death overall. Having the list limited to one butterfish I thought was also a great idea. If a team's going to shoot one butterfish, they're going to shoot two butterfish. So there's no point having two in there. Find the food and find the predators. That's the theory anyway. If you find the food, stick around long enough and you're going to find some predators. More often than not. However, it can often take a lot of time at the bottom. Sometimes you can go down, spend a minute or two down there and really not see anything except bait. It's a bit of luck, a bit of skill and being at the right place at the right time. 
Spend enough time with the bait, scan around, look around and eventually you'll find kingfish. However, you can be doing this for a while before you see any results. Between dives, I have a minimum surface interval of double my bottom time. Meaning I can't go down straight away. I'm going to let my buddy know what's up so he can go and have a crack. Big skull of mackerel all freaking out. Big skull of mackerel freaking out. Yeah, go down, they'll be kingies. Spending twice your bottom time at the surface is what's recommended as a safe minimum for free diving. If I spend one minute at the bottom, I'm spending two on the surface. If I spend two at the bottom, I'm spending four on the surface. It can be a bit tedious, but it's less tedious than being dead. No kingfish for now, unfortunately. So we decide to head back for the boat, check out our catch, and have some water. Staying hydrated is very important when you're diving to maintain optimal performance. Beautiful snapper from your boy Marcus. This one could very well be the difference. After some water and a little photo shoot, we're back into the ocean. We're not going to shoot any fish sitting on the boat, so we've got to get back into it. I've decided to swap out the pole spear for my trusty roller gun. The fishing today was quite a lot harder than we expected. There's just sand there, so we're heading a little bit close and try to find the edge. I reckon that's where the kingies will be, hopefully. The day is starting to draw on, and this is where the nervousness starts. Have we done well? Have we done badly? Have we shot enough fish? Are we going to place right? Is it going to be embarrassing weighing our fish at the weigh station in front of everybody else? But you can't worry about that. You just got to keep diving. Keep doing your best until the time runs out. Less thinking and more feeling. That's how you dive well. Be in the zone and in the moment. Not worrying about the future or the past. One up, one down. Watching each other as we dive. By this point, our system is working very well. Swapping the gun between us, making dives down to the bottom, watching each other for safety and communicating on the surface. This is what buddy diving is all about. Not swimming off in other directions, hundreds of meters away from each other, where you're too far to do anything, if your help was ever needed. Buddy diving, you're right there watching your buddy. It's not buddy diving if you're off doing your own thing, not watching them. We found a spot that was holding fish. So we're doing drops up and down, sitting on the spot, trying to maximize bottom time, hoping to get a kingfish to come through. This is the fish that we are hoping for. We know this is going to be a great point sooner if we get it, and will likely be the difference between placing a few different places. You know, a kingfish is a huge deal on the competition for the species points plus the weight in limited visibility you need to be constantly analyzing constantly scanning for when that fish that you want comes through if a kingfish comes through and sees me i might only have a split second to make that shot so i need to be ready looking around anticipating that fish to come through just because we're out here for serious business doesn't mean we can't have a little bit of fun as well. Decided to blow a couple bubble rings, thought this was a cool scene. Got the bro markers at the top, a few fish in the foreground. We had some absolutely stunning weather for the competition. 20 knot winds, rain, a bit of thunder here and there. It's beautiful diving conditions. But given that, the visibility wasn't as shocking as I had expected. On my way down to the bottom, I thought that my camera was off. When I get to the bottom, I see some kingfish. Turning my GoPro off, basing my head towards the ground. I realize at this moment that I turned it off, so I flick it back on again, but when I put my head up, the kingfish are nowhere to be seen. This was my pretty much one opportunity, the only kingfish that I'd seen all day, and I totally screwed it up. Spearfishing can be pretty funny sometimes. You spend hours to get an opportunity that you can screw up in a couple of seconds. The small amount of time they had my head down in the kelp filling around with my GoPro was enough for the kingfish to lose interest entirely and leave me alone. That's just how it goes sometimes. Diving nationals with a GoPro is not the optimal strategy. It was honestly very distracting at times. However, I don't regret it. I'm going to be able to look at this video in future years and see what I can do to improve for subsequent performances. I'm hoping as well this video can inspire some of you guys to try out some competitive spearfishing. If you thought about going to nationals this year but decided not to, next year I would 100% recommend it. It's an awesome competition, you get to meet some awesome people 
and it's really not as scary as it sounds straight off the bat. You think you're going to be going up against absolute weapons and there's no possible chance of doing well? It can be misleading. A lot of people aren't as good as they let on. Myself included. Seriously though, have a crack and you might surprise yourself. You're going to have fun at the very least. At its core, spearfishing is not a competitive sport. And that's one of the things that I love about it. In the past, I have played competitive sports, team sports. The team versus team dynamic can be very toxic. Teams battling it out, fighting each other, and you really can't sort of be on good terms with the other team a lot of the time. Even in spearfishing competitions, the people that you're competing against, it feels like brothers in arms. We have an appreciation for the same thing. We like the same thing, and we all get along pretty well. I played rugby when I was younger. A lot of it came down to people just being genuinely nasty to each other, and parents yelling from the sidelines. Hurt him, tackle him. It's just not a fun environment. Spearfishing, we all get along a bit better. Spearfishing can be very clicky though, and there's a lot of unnecessary politics. In the last few minutes of the competition, I'm approached by a school of kawai. I've got to make this shot. I've got to get these fish. It's now or never. And I miss. Absolutely tragic. I was gutted. My heart was beating so fast. Last minute golden opportunity from the ocean, but I absolutely squandered it. Can't win them all. Can't dwell on it, but can't be making silly mistakes like that if you want to be doing well in a spearfishing competition. The things that really stick with you at the end of the day are not the fish you land, but the fish you don't. The mistakes you make are what defines your performance. And that will conclude day two in the water. Now it's time to hang tight, make it back to the mainland, weigh our fish, and see how we did. IRBs have got to be the goat when it comes to spearfishing vehicles. So fast, so maneuverable, relatively cheap, and just ideal for getting to the spearfishing spots. These things absolutely zip through the water. You don't need a cabin on there when you're not a little bitch fisherman. Oh, I'm gonna get wet. Uh -huh. Put a wetsuit on, get in the water. A huge thank you to Dwayne and Kobe for letting Marcus and I ride out on their boat. Excellent ride, got a great skipper, managed to get some advice, and it was really cool to see how they did things. And now it's to the weigh station. We're feeling pretty chuffed on the snapper we'd shot at the start of the day. However, we didn't have a huge catch overall. So we were very curious to see what would happen. On snapper. 7.85. On day two, we managed to weigh in three fish. A John Dory, a butterfish, and a good snapper. It's not going to be a lot of points, but today was a lot harder. Most teams catching only a couple of fish. Everything that was shot, with the exception of a few fish taken by the competitors, was auctioned off for the local fire brigade, with all proceeds going to them. Watching the bidding was actually one of the highlights for me. We're going to sell it for 50 then, let me be very, very clear. First call. 55. Yep. Oh, 55. 55. <laughs> 55. <laughs> oh. 60 right inside. Yep. 60. 60 and 65. 65. 65 and 70 from you. Very, very clear. First call. Second call. The last one. Sold. Yes, well done, Brian. Thank you. The money. Got pockets. John Dory here. A nice snack size John Dory. Very nice little kingfish. Not as big as the last one, but at this size, at this size, it's sort of five and a half kilos. They're actually really tender, really beautiful. So sashimi, ceviche. Grilled any way you want, but if you want some severe, so... At $50, it's yours in the bag. First call, second call, third and fourth, oh, the last... 55! 55! Give me the last bit of the night! This is the last one, and 60 we got! Okay, I'll give you the, I'll give you the four bucks. 60, this man's got it in the bag, and I'm giving him four... I'm paying people to bid! $60, 65 from you, sir, come on. Come on, Roy. He's still got his hand up, I'll take you a bit at 65. Thank you very much. And $70 from you. 70 go on mate, he's got it in the bag, right. there he is, what's at $65, he's got it in the bag, what that? what's the bid? 65, one more and you got it, one more, 65, give this man a big round of applause, the star of the show, with his hands wide in the air, first, second, third, fourth, so.
Thank you so much for coming for a great cause. I hope you have a great afternoon. I really appreciate you sticking with us. I certainly enjoyed myself and I won't go hungry at all you. Thanks guys. Just want to say thank you very much. The Fisher Auctions have now raised pretty much on 3,000 bucks. Competition, done an amazing job. Thank you very much, Peter. It hasn't been easy. Two little fellas. Couldn't go to two better guys. I've just spent a, a bit of time in Tahiti with you, Jackson. It's been a pleasure. Jackson Shields, all best. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to watch and listen. I hope you enjoyed. That's it for Nationals footage. Here's some upcoming footage that you can look forward to. I just wanted to take some time at the end of the video to recap and talk about the way things have been. The New Zealand Spearfishing Nationals 2022 was a challenging year with tough diving conditions and a low number of fish caught. Despite these difficulties, Marcus and I were able to place 10th and win B Division, earning a mean trophy. Congratulations to the overall winners. Jackson Shields, and Paul Best. B Division is composed of all competitors who have not previously placed in the top 10, so Marcus and I were essentially the best of the worst. Over the past few months, my video uploads have slowed down because I want to make sure that I'm putting out the right message with my art. I recently had someone comment that I sounded sad in a video. My mental state during production has a big impact on the end product, particularly apparent in voiceovers. The past year has been a struggle for me. For the first time in my life, I have properly struggled with mental health. I've spent most of the year unemployed, plenty of time for diving, but the reality was me alone in my room, wasting my life, consuming instead of creating, resenting, borderline hating myself as I watch potential slip away and myself sink into what I guess is a depression. But I have made some big changes and things are better for me now, which is why you are seeing this video. It didn't feel right for me forcing myself to create content when I wasn't in a mood that I wanted to put out to people. I feel like a part of me is transmitted through my videos and when I'm in a bad mood I'm not putting out a good influence on the world. When I'm in a good mood, when I'm happy, when I'm positive, that's when I can make changes for the better and that's when I should be making videos. Not when I'm sad and not when I'm depressed. And that's why this video has been on ice for so long. Nationals happened in December. This video was essentially done about a week after then. I've just been waiting for to sort some things out in my life and then record the voiceover when I know that I'm in a safe, comfortable place where I'm happy and can talk openly. Not one of those days where you're at home all day, you talk to no one, you don't go out and the only time you speak the entire day is to your microphone. That changes now. I'm in a happy, comfortable living situation. I plan on making content more frequently. So look forward to it. Thank you very much for all the love and support. It means the world to me. I'm going to continue to work on blue neoprene and use it to make the world a better place with your help. This episode's sustainability message is if you go into a spearfishing competition, read the fish list carefully. However, wait, before you go, I have some more advice for you. Just some general life advice. You need to look after yourself and stay healthy to protect the things and the people that you love in your life. Always have a backup plan, a contingency, a plan B. Don't put all your eggs in one basket because if you drop that basket, you're fucked. Be careful with contracts and make sure you fully understand them before signing. Don't isolate yourself and surround yourself with good people who you can talk to. Never judge a person based on their appearance or projection, as everybody has a dark side. Hidden thoughts and feelings. Be wary of those who make an effort to seem kind, as they may be trying to deceive or manipulate you. Anyway, on a brighter note, I hope you enjoyed. I enjoyed making this video, and I can't wait to share it with you. Thank you so much for everything. Much love from your boy, Blue. <laughs> oh, that felt so good. <laughs>